welcome to the Chicago Justice Show. I'm your host, Tracy Siska. I'm also the executive director of the Chicago Justice Project. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Want to find out more about our transparency and accountability work? Go to chicagojustice.org. All right, we're going to jump right into it, ladies and gentlemen. What might be a seismic shift that most people in America would have no idea that what it means. So the headline from a BEZ piece is After 25 years in the dark, the CDC wants to study the true toll of guns in America. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we barely study gun violence. It gets nowhere near the amount of federal dollars as almost any other type of violence or anything that we really need in America. Out of those things, gun violence, it's a very, very, very small amount of money. Let's take a look at the article and we'll find out a little bit about why that is and what the changes may be. So the article goes on, CDC data that just, data that just over 100 people on average are killed by firearms in the US every day that includes crimes, suicides, gun accidents, and shootings involving law enforcement. But how, is some, how often is someone injured? What kind of weapons are used? What are the underlying causes? Relationship between the victim and sh the shooter and the victim. What evidence-based scalable programs work best to help prevent criminal shootings, accidents, and suicides? Basically, we don't have enough information on any of that. But why is the question? They're in the dark partially because for more than two decades, the gun lobby and Republican allies in Congress effectively blocked federal funding for firearms research, arguing that such study would undermine the constitutional rights of lawful gun owners. Yep. Gun right advocates know and they understand just how devastating guns are to our country. They know that allowing the federal government to fund systemic research on guns and their impact would lead the country to get rid of guns. Or at least significantly curtail them back. They don't want that because the gun rights um, nut jobs, cult in America. They don't want that. So, of course, the soulless politicians that we have in Congress have been fighting that, fighting that, fighting that. Don't worry about the body counts. Don't worry about any of it. The toll it takes. Don't worry about the it, life, the impact on victims and families and our communities and the cost, the financial cost. They don't care. I think if they are fiscal, if they were true fiscally conservative, they would really want to study the hell out of guns and find out how to reduce the cost to the economy and the public and the government and gun violence. The article continues. As a result of that and other factors, experts say in-depth gun data collection and sharing in the U.S. is a tangled mess that undermines objective research on programs and politicians intended to prevent, or um, not politicians, programs and policies intended to prevent firearm injury, suicide, and criminal violence. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now listen, gun collect data collection on crime and violence is horrific. And generally across the country, crime incident data, crime data, some other data related to crimes and violence is, is captured um, by the Uniform Crime Report and, that, and the Uniform Crime Report is run by the FBI and that's being replaced by NIBRS or the National Instant Based Reporting System. And that's going to provide us more um, refined data. Even that is really a mess. There's a LEMIS, there's a, a part of it's called Law Enforcement Management and Administration, and I forgot what the last word is in. But even in that, the police departments lie. And the, there is no regulation, really, because it's a voluntary program because of separation of church, um, 
uh, separation of powers, the police departments don't really have to respond honestly. So they don't, or they don't respond. In Lemus, the reason I brought that up is it's, it's supposed to report staffing by police agency every year. That's a disaster. Disaster. It took us two or three years, many years ago, to get staffing numbers by pol- the five top, well, four of the top five largest police agencies. And I threw Phoenix in because I screwed up and replaced it with Phil- I, I replaced Philadelphia with Phoenix. But it took us a few years. When we called the New York Police Department, they basically laughed and hung up on us. They didn't care about FOIA. It wasn't until we started threatening to sue that they finally gave that number up. And, of course, it was four or five, 6,000 officers different than what they report to the Lemus um, reporting system. So, yes, this needs to be massively improved. The article continues. CDC and NIH are funding new research on guns to help reduce firearm-related injuries, deaths, crimes, and suicides. Among several other gun research projects, the CDC is now providing funding to 10 state health departments so they can start collecting data in near real time on emergency room non-fatal firearm injuries. This will allow doctors and epidemiologists to potentially potentially identify trends and craft swift interventions as they have done to contain the coronavirus pandemic and other national health emergencies. Ladies and gentlemen, you realize it is 2021 and now the government's going to start funding that? That's how ridiculous, polarized, broken our country is. They just don't Gun rights advocates don't care about the impact. And I think it's a mixture of alt-right people, um, religiousness is mixed in on that. And for those who don't know, the, the I was going to call the alcohol back on firearms, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, was started by hunters, and they were pro-gun regulation. Because hunters don't want people out there with AK-47s or, you know, chain-fed machine guns or any of that. They don't want that. Grenade launchers, any of that. They don't want that. They don't want guns on the streets. Responsible ones don't. But they got taken over. And this is what we're left with. The, this is this carnage and this political damage and corruption and rot in America is laid at the feet of the National Rifle Association, 100%. It's sad, but it is it is unfortunately reality. Um, this is good news that the CDC and NIH are funding these things. We'll see what comes out of this research. I have my doubts. Um, we'll see how uh, systemic it is. If it's done right, methodically, I think America is going to be shocked by some of the things that it finds. Um, and this goes, plays right into our next segment. FBI, this is a story from NPR. FBI data shows an unprecedented spike in murders nationwide in 2020. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Murders are up all over the country all over the country in just about every urban area and many many smaller urban centers it is not just chicago new york la houston philly phoenix miami boston seattle it's not just the big urban centers driving this increase the reason i wanted to talk about this Specifically, and I'm trying to drive this home, and it's so hard in social media and everything that's going on and all the noise about all the shootings. There was just one, um, and, uh, um, they're all bad, but particularly bad one in River North. Um, yesterday or the day before, I think it was yesterday at some point. Shootings are up everywhere, all over the country. How in the hell, if that is true? Are we going to find solutions to these huge problems that are affecting our entire 
society or many places in our society. How are we going to find those in Chicago? How do we expect the mayor to find them? How do we expect the police department, Chicago Police Department, to find those solutions all by themselves? Hmm? How do we expect the city council to do that? These are, this is a national problem. Now, does Chicago have an endemic issue with violence? Sure, it does. Is Chicago's socioeconomic race segregation, economic situation different than most, if not all, urban centers, except for maybe Detroit to some extent? Yes. Did Chicago lose more industrial jobs than any city in the country as we switched? Um, to exporting them, I think originally in Mexico, then to China, and now all over Southeast Asia and other places. Yes, Chicago lost more than any other city. Now, ladies and gentlemen, think about that. Chicago lost more in whole numbers, not per capita numbers, whole numbers. They lost more than New York. Different economies. You add that with the segregation, the um, ever um, increasing deprivation of these communities, pulling out more and more and more and more resources and throwing in more and more and more policing. It's not making things better. Now, we need to find national systemic solutions to these problems. When you look at the crime drop from the early 90s till about 2015 in Chicago, given a year or, here, year or two there, here, um, and just recently in most of the country, I think we get upticks in 20 and 21, um, I, I strictly think due to the pandemic, but that decrease all those years, every year just about, it was a nationwide decrease, two, three, four percent a year, every year, tick, tick. How in the world could the causes for that decline be the police agency in your local area? There were 18,000 plus, somewhere around 19,000 police agencies in the United States, federal and, and local. You tell me it's the policies that are from 18,000 different agencies that are doing it all around the same amount, all over the country, all at the same time. No. The statistical probability of that is as close to zero as you can possibly get. That is not it. Do we know what the major decline is? We don't. On TYT recently, inappropriately, there's an interesting theory around lead getting uh, out of water in the 70s, but that doesn't hold to why it would have kept going, kept declining. Um, so I wouldn't doubt that lead has something to do with it. There's issues around the legalization of abortion. There's all these possible reasons. No one really knows why. That's a problem. We should have spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, researching what the hell is going on. We didn't. And basically that's because people in Congress don't want this thing studied. All they want is things Leave our guns alone and throw everyone in prison, especially if they're black and brown. It's their fault. Throw them in prison. So there's around a 30% increase in violent crime in 20 shootings, murders. Um, who with any foresight at all, and you know, just a little bit of common sense, didn't see this coming in a worldwide pandemic of such unbelievable lethal proportions. All this did is put a, um, like a turbocharger into all the ways underserved communities are disenfranchised. And then it put a turbocharger in there because what it did is it, ex it, it, it greatly increased the likelihood of them dying from the disease. So you expect to come out of that or go through that and not see a massive increase in crime. That to me is in 
Nuts. I don't understand who's shocked. Experts are shocked. Murders are up. Like, you got to be out of your goddamn mind. What are you shocked by? A worldwide pandemic is going to exacerbate circumstances that are in communities that are most underserved. Exacerbates the circumstances, blah, the circumstances um, in all the communities. So you're expecting it to be not have a massive impact on all the negative things in underserved communities. You're insane. Now, I want to get to another point here because, and this was echoed in TYT too. Uh, Jenk and um, Anna talked about it, and they're probably a little wrong about this. Let me just say that we don't know because the police departments didn't capture how many shootings there were in urban centers across the country during the 90s. In fact, up until maybe 2014 or 15 or 12 or 17. I don't remember exactly when the media um, stopped doing their job and started counting shootings and thought they were like, they're the best. Um, it's not a horrible thing, but we don't have the context we need to understand what's going on now compared to decades before. Now. As I've said on this show before, comparing 2020 and 20, 2020 and 2021 urban crime, shootings, violence, crime, homicides to any other year outside of like 19, what was it, 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu. No, come on. You can't even compare it now to then. It's just totally different circumstances in the country. So it's not right to compare what's going on, going on now to 1990s. When you look at homicides and say, well, homicides are 150, 200, tw excuse me, 200 lower. In New York, they're like 1,500 lower. Yeah, 1,500 out of 2,000. You see the massive drop New York has experienced now. New York has also been unbelievably, unconscionably gentrified, but that's all another issue. The, 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 the degree to which medical science, i.e. hospitals, has advanced in their ability to keep a shooting victim alive between, say, 1992, 91, 90, 89, 88, when it was the worst time, that like four or five year block there, I think was the, pretty much the worst of it. The, the ability for, let's say, what, nine, 30 years ago, the, the, the medical advances have been astronomical. The technolo technological advances um, have changed dramatically. I'm, I'm broadcasting this show from my apartment in D.C. And I'm broadcasting on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. Come on. So it's also inappropriate. Why well, I don't think you should ever make those comparisons. Making the comparisons, let's say we get past this pandemic in 2024 and somehow with everyone vac vaccinated, COVID becomes like a flu. Like the flu. Um, still, you cannot compare 2025's numbers to 1991 and say, how are we? Are we still the worst or the best? Um, the ability for medical... The hospitals to save people's lives now that they couldn't save 20, 30, 40 years ago is unbelievably uh, better now than it was. It's almost being like in the dark ages back then. So it is inappropriate. I know you see numbers like, wow, this is the last, least violent we've been since, you know, or um, 19, you know, 1965 or something. You can look at homicides, but the real telltale number is actually shootings. Because the reality is police department play a very little and no role once the trigger is pulled, there's been a failure of the justice system to prevent the shooting. That's the justice system. They're supposed to either prevent the shooting or arrest the person that does the shooting. They have very little to do with whether someone lives or dies. They're now starting to do more first aid on the scene, so that's an improvement too. But the reality is whether someone lives or dies has very little to do with the police department. So the real number to look at between now and 1965 or 75 or 85 or 95 or 2005 or 2015 is shootings. The problem is... 
under the Uniform Crime Report, there is no category that says shootings. Aggravated batteries, you know, aggravated assaults, attempted homicides, homicides, that data really isn't there. Is the data, if you went through the CPD's records from those years, there? It certainly is. But you'd have to go through all those paper records for the entire department of a city of 3 million people. It'd be a mammoth, unprecedented, unbelievable undertaking. So I would just take pretty much anything there. When you hear those results, when those comments from mostly the media and some experts, take them with a huge gallon of salt because they, they don't compare. These years don't compare to any other years because of the pandemic, but the reality is medical has changed so much and we don't know the number of people shot in 2000 or 2005. Um, we don't know in 1995. So it's partly due to the police department not wanting to release numbers and not have to capture numbers they don't want captured and weren't required to capture and partly due to just that's just the way the system was at the time. So just take it, take it with a grain of salt. All right, we're going to do a quick third segment here. And investigate, all right, headline from the Tribune, I believe. Yes, it is the Tribune. Investigation of Joliet policing won't focus on Eric Lowry's death but could be a powerful thing to spark change, AG's office says at Town Hall. Okay, what does this mean? I think I was already doing my show. I think So I think in 2020, mid-2020-ish, early summer last year, the only attorney general's office got the ability to do what the Federal Civil Rights Division did to the Chicago Police Department, which is do a pattern and practice investigation that led to the federal consent de decree that is overseen by a federal judge. The Illinois Attorney General's Office now has the ability to do that on local police departments. And I believe they can enter into consent decrees um, after pattern and practice investigation uncovers issues. And They can get a judge to um, force in and oversee a consent decree. I believe that's what this is. Now, I welcome this. Here's my problem. And I'm trying to get uh, Attorney General Kwame Raul on our show. Who has faith in the Illinois Attorney General's office to do this? And if you do, I would ask why. Uh, I'm being honest. Senator, State Senator Kwame Raul introduced a bill, sponsored a bill, to allow prosecutor's office to not have to abide by the Illinois Freedom of Information Act towards the end of his career, before he became Attorney General. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have to question how much he really cares about the issue. Next, we have an office created by Lisa Manigan, who just spoke at a fundraiser for Attorney General Raul in the last couple of days. Former Attorney General Lisa Manigan. She got the power in 2010, uh, 2009, when the, the act went into, um, um, into place January 1st, 2010, but in 2009, an update to the Illinois Freedom of Information Act passed and it created an office in her office, Illinois Attorney General's office, called the Public Access Counselor that's supposed to do, among other things, um, provide rulings on whether or not uh, local agencies have broken the, broken the FOIA or whether or not they have uh, failed to comply with the Open Meetings Act and then where, um, where possible, sue, uh, offer a binding resolution uh, decision in favor of the person uh, seeking the approval, seeking the review, and then sue the local police, the local agencies, not police departments necessarily, local, local, local public body, so that the citizen would not have to bear the cost of this, because that's part of the disincentive the agencies count on. The public access counselor's office, for the most part, sucks. 
for the most part, they may do better with open meetings, but the, in the FOIA, they're awful. I once got a, um, uh, a decision from them after a review that said, the, the, this is under Jody Weiss's time, so it's somewhere between 2009 and 2011, and they basically said since the police department, Chicago Police Department, has not talked about the study they paid to have done, they don't have to release it. It's staggeringly stupid. There are like five or seven, eight, whatever the exemptions are. If it doesn't fit the exemption, it's open. It didn't fit any exemption. This is just how the PAC, and this is in the first office of the, the first person running the PAC, which is Terry Mushler, who I know now, that was under her. I mean, these, this office is sucks. So why the Attorney General's office is going to do this better, I don't know. Now, as far as looking into the murder of Eric Lurie, the Attorney General's office doesn't do criminal investigations. They can, in the midst of an investigation they're doing, they can refer out something if they uh, happen upon criminal activity. Now, it might be what's going on here. Listen, does the Joliet Police Department need a review? I'm sure they do. They've made the news a lot in the last few years. I used to teach out there. They probably do need the review. I wouldn't be surprised if the Illinois Attorney General's office is partially doing this review so that they can look into the Lurie case and refer it out. But they don't want to say publicly, we're doing this because we're looking into the Lurie case because they that law that authorizes the review, the pattern and practice review, doesn't say you can go investigate a separate individual murder. So is that part of the calculus that goes into the motivation of going after Joliet? Yes, 100%. Okay. Um, it'll be interesting. Now, you got to understand something. We have a problem in that the Will County State Attorney's Office, which I used to teach across the parking lot from, is run by a uh, prosecutor named Jan James Glasgow. For those who remember, he came in under Riley. He came in while the Riley Fox case was ongoing. Riley Fox was a girl that was kidnapped from her home and murdered. Her father, hours later, during a search with the police and everything, found the girl's body in a um, creek. I'm not sure if he found it or if the police found it. After months, they arrested uh, the father, saying he did it, Kevin Fox, saying he sort of confessed. Kevin Fox hired a all-out um, attack dog lawyer, and her name is escaping me right now. During this time... There was an election for Will County State's Attorney. Glasgow wins. Fox's lawyer goes to Glasgow and says, we will pay for DNA tests. And Glasgow feels cornered, so he does it. It exonerates Fox. He spends a total of about 11 months, I think, in, in jail, awaiting trial. But it's all over the media. He's confessed. He did this. He did this. Um... He, they then start reinvestigating the case. I believe this, either the FBI or the state police got involved. They missed a shoe next to the body, within 10 feet of the body or 15 feet of the body or something like that. That shoe had initials. They never did a check of uh, recent sex offenders that moved into the area. Um, they do that check now that they have the shoe. The shoe has initials in it. It matches the initials of a sex offender in the area. Bing, 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 boom. They convict that guy of... They get that guy, they arrest that guy, right? Now, they announce the arrest the day Kevin Fox, who had sued, who won like $14 million in his lawsuit, it gets appealed. They announce the arrest of this new guy the day the appeal, the decision from the appellate court comes handed down. Well, what's in that appellate court ruling? Well, because of technical reasons, the appellate court reduces the, the, the amount to pay by a million or two but spend like dozens and dozens of pages just ripping the Will County Sheriff's Office and the Will County Prosecutor's Office for their horrible, horrific, unbelievably disgusting investigation. Now, that day they hold a press conference when the ruling comes down and because the press conference announces the arrest of the sex offender in the area that they got. Glasgow's question, what would you say to Kevin Fox, who spent 11 months in prison for... I think sexually assaulting and murdering his daughter, even though he had never done it, and you told everyone he did it, and he's all over the world being known as he did it. What would you say to him? And Glasgow says, 
Well, we, we really want him to cooperate with our investigation because we really need to know what's wrong and in, her, in his personality that led him to confess. Yep, that is after losing a $14 million judgment at court for wrongful arrest and wrongful prosecution. And then, ladies and gentlemen, they lost in the appellate court and the appellate court ruling is horrific. I mean, it's great if you're for the rights of uh, wrongly convicted people, but it is brutal on Glasgow and brutal on his office and brutal on the Will County Sheriff's Office. I mean, you could see how Trumpism could take because that was a total Trumpism thing to say. So if you're going to get um, justice in Eric Lurie case, it has to go through James Glasgow. Who the hell thinks they're going to get that? Um, and just a side note, um, before I close this segment down, I, after Glasgow's comments, which were live in a press conference that I watched, I wrote a blog like, he's got to go. It, uh, I don't remember what year this is, maybe 2010, 11. It's like, it's impossible that you could be this uninformed about what causes wrongful convictions. There had been plenty of academic research to show what did it, and there was plenty documented in the, decision, the appellate court decision about what his prosecutors and the Will County Sheriff's Office, not his at the time, but they fought, ended up being his prosecutors, and the Will County Sheriff's Office did to cause that wrongful, the sort of confession, because it never was really determined whether he actually confessed or not. And I got a call from one of Glasgow's people begging me to take it down, which I had never had. So if you um, search James Glasgow and Chicago Justice Project in Google, I'm sure it will come up. Um, we will see. We're going to be following what going, what's going on with um, the investigation of the Joliet Police Department. I hope it, it has good results and it's done thoroughly and professionally. Um, I, it's not that I necessarily have my doubts in Attorney General Al Rule. I, I have my doubts in the Illinois Attorney General's office to do that thoroughly, have the resources and time uh, to methodically and thoroughly do the investigation that needs to be done. They haven't done anything for the most part in the year subsequent to this to prove that they need it. I and mean, they prove they have the capacity to do this. I hope I am wrong. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please check out CJP Nation if you want to get involved in our uh, research and crowdsource research projects, public policy advocacy, fundraising for us if you want to, um, and plenty other work helping us along. I'd appreciate it. We will be back Monday at 9 a.m. And just a quick reminder, Tuesday, 9 a.m. Central on chicagojustice.org. We will be publishing our piece on violence against women and what the data says about it in Chicago. And um, today... It is. It's officially um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, it's something we should all be talking more about, and we're going to jumpstart that conversation on Tuesday morning at 9. Okay, I will see everyone Monday at 9 back here. Thank you so much.